this week, Adam, you, you may have noticed, is gone, and uh, I've been helping out with the community education basketball program that meets here Tuesday nights at Eagle View Elementary School. So guys, men, if you're interested in coming out and play, nothing bad ever happens during basketball, okay? Oh, this is why Adam has been taking the last couple of weeks off from basketball. He didn't want to have any weird fluke injury that would disrupt his trip and uh, the things that he had going on. So uh, Adam, we do miss you, but you were wise to set out basketball the last couple of weeks. Uh, yes, this was a fluke incident, uh, two back-to-back -back injuries happening just like at the exact same time, worst case scenario. And so uh, thankfully nothing's broken. They just hurt a lot, so, <laughs> especially when I'm trying to hold a drumstick and play the drums and miss. So anyway, I don't know about you, but I am terrible when it comes to waiting. It, there's probably nothing that gets my blood boiling more than when I have somewhere that I need to be or I have something that I need to accomplish and I'm told that I have to wait, right? There is no peace in my waiting, there is absolutely no peace. It's like I have this dark, luminous cloud that's hanging over my head until I can get to that thing that I am looking forward to, that thing that I want to accomplish or get it done. There is no peace in my waiting. It's only imperfect peace or impatient peace or maybe irritable peace or, yes, even some days some angry peace finds its way into my life while I have to wait for something outside of my control. Anybody else relate to that? Maybe waiting for this pandemic to end? Yeah I, yeah, I don't know. Well, this week has given me an opportunity, as they might say, to live out a sermon that I needed to hear before I could preach it. Uh, and so I can't say that I passed my waiting with flying colors throughout the week. As I waited for a car to get done, as I waited for a dog to be neutered, as I waited for fingers to heal, and as I waited, I kid you not, for the computer to reboot and do an install in the middle of writing the first paragraph of the sermon. Like, talk about God timing, right? Like, okay, you think you're ready to go on this sermon on waiting? I'm going to make you wait a little longer. Okay, thanks. Jeez. All right, God, I get it. I'm not very good when it comes to waiting. Let's just say it's been a week of less than patient peace, less than perfect peace. Impatient peace, maybe. Grumpy peace, yes. But perfect peace, now that is the peace that we are often searching for in the midst of our waiting, isn't it? Last week, we kicked off our, our message series called uh, Missing Peace with the story of Jesus calming the storm on the Sea of Galilee. And we looked at this story and we realized that it's easy to trust Jesus when the sun is shining when it's above 20 below zero, when the waters are calm, not because they're frozen thick with ice, right? It's easy to trust Jesus on those good days, but in the middle of the storm, that's when our fear takes over. That's when our, our fear overcomes our faith sometimes and can sink us, and we lose our way. But we learned last week that the missing piece we are looking for is not found in the absence of a storm, but it's found in the presence of our Savior, and so we looked at, the, uh, at Jesus calming the storm, and we realized that trusting Jesus means that we place, and finding that missing piece means we put our trust in Jesus at all times and in all places. But what about those times in which it seems like God is silent and we're waiting? What about those areas of our life where it seems like we are still waiting on God for answers? How may we discover that peace that we are missing even in our waiting? And just, just how long are we supposed to wait, God, before we give up and we move on? 400 years. Can you imagine 400 years of silence? 400 years of waiting upon the Lord? Israel waited 400 years from the time of the last prophecy that we see recorded in the Old Testament to the time of John the Baptist arriving in the New Testament to announce the way of the Messiah. 400 years passed by in what we refer to as the intertestamental period, this gap between our, our New Testament and our Old Testament and our Bibles. 400 years of silence and waiting. 400 years of occupation by foreign oppressors. Do you think they were tired of waiting? Do you think they were longing for some sort of hope, some sort of peace? Certainly they were. 
Israel had been defeated. Persia began by ruling over them, and while they may have experienced some religious freedoms and they were allowed to, to rebuild the temple and to resume temple uh, worship at the temple, they still longed to be restored, to see God's kingdom fully restored once again. Then came the Greeks, and you may have heard, heard of somebody by the name of Alexander the Great, who defeated the Persians, he conquered the Middle East, and this led to the rise of the Greek culture and the Greek language. For the first time, there was a common language that was spoken throughout the Middle East, throughout the land, Greek. And the Hebrew Testaments, the Hebrew Scriptures, were actually translated into Greek, and a lot of the, the texts that are quoted in the New Testament actually come from the Greek translation of the Old Testament. By now, the Jewish people had been scattered throughout the entire empire, and so had their faith. The Greek culture was very worldly, though, and it was very ungodly, and this was a problem because the pagan practices were detestable to God. And eventually, things turned against the Jewish people when about 167 B.C., their religion was outlawed, and their priests were replaced, and the temple was desecrated and defiled, and so the people revolted. Judas Maccabeus and uh, the Hasmoneans, the people of his family and his tribe, led the way in restoring the rightful priests and rescuing the temple and overthrowing those who were occupying. But this period was not filled with peace. It was filled with war and infighting amongst the tribes, and it was filled with violence. Then in 63 B.C., Rome conquered Israel, and a man by the name of Pompey, and maybe you've heard of Julius Caesar, the Roman Empire expands, and it, it takes over like the whole world, it seemed like. And while they still were occupied by a foreign power, they did experience a, t a period that of relative peace, a period that we know of, uh, maybe you've learned about this in school, or not yet, AJ, the Pas Romana, right, this period of peace. But it's kind of hard to really experience that full peace when there's somebody else telling you, you should be peaceful. I'm ruling over you now, <laughs> right? And so it's kind of this pseudo peace here. But during the time of the Romans, what, did they, what were the Romans known for building? Anybody know what they built? Some nice road systems, right? They had these improvements to the culture and society, and they built these road systems, and they established these trade routes over land and sea, and suddenly communication lines were open. And it was possible to send a message from one part of the empire to the other part of the empire. And by the time we come to the New Testament, it is estimated that 4 million Jews lived in the Roman Empire. They made up about 7% of the Roman Empire population. But of those 4 million Jews, only 700,000 of them remained in Palestine, in their homeland. The rest were scattered throughout the known world. For 400 years, God was silent while Israel was tossed about from one foreign ruler to another. Twelve generations, think about that, twelve generations grew up not experiencing God the way their ancestors had. Twelve generations had grown up only hearing about the prophetic word that God had given. And twelve generations grew up trying to hold on to this faith of their ancestors. Wondering, God, where are you? Have you abandoned us? Have you abandoned your people? Why didn't you come to your aid? Why didn't you rescue us? Lord, you promised a Messiah. You promised to deliver. Now would be a great time to send him. We're still waiting, God. 400 years, we're still waiting, God. When will you show up? But you know something? While they were waiting, God was working. While they were waiting, God was was working. Mary wasn't the only one who was pregnant with hope at the beginning of the New Testament. In fact, all of Israel was waiting for God to do something. God was setting the stage for the arrival of the Messiah. God was preparing that exact right moment in history in order to enter into the world as one of us. A time that would be ripe, a time that there was a common language, a time that the scriptures were translated and available, a time in which the roads were established and lines of communication were created to help spread the gospel message throughout the entire known world. To a people who had faith in God, who believed in God, who were waiting for the Messiah to come. 
God was picking the perfect moment in history to enter into the world, a time in which even the Greeks and the Romans were becoming dissatisfied with their own mythologies and their own religions, and they were starting to wonder about the one true God. The time was ripe, and so while they were waiting, God was working. The time had come. Simeon and Anna had spent their entire lives waiting upon God. They were righteous and devout, we are told. They were dedicated to the Lord. They were looking for that promised one, the Messiah that they had read about and heard about in the Old Testament. And being spiritually in tune with God, it was revealed to Simeon that he would not pass, he would not die until that day in which the Messiah would come. Moved by the Spirit, Simeon went to the temple that day at just the right moment, at just the right time, and there he encountered the Messiah. That moment of waiting had finally come. You ever notice how our timing might be a little bit off, but God's timing is always spot on? God knew what he was doing when he chose this specific period of history to send his son into the world. God knew what he was doing when he came to his people at just the perfect moment in history to share the gospel. He was even orchestrating the events of this day so that this promise to Simeon would come true. And so taking the child into his arms, Simeon praises God and he gives thanks. And Anna, a widow who was also there, who had dedicated her entire life to worshiping at the temple, came and joined him. Luke tells us that she also gave praise to God and began telling everyone that she could who was looking forward to the redemption of Israel all about this child. The moment they were waiting for had finally come. You see, I don't know if you ever thought about this before, but in our waiting, the world doesn't stop spinning. The world doesn't come to an end just because we are waiting. In our waiting, God is still working. Sometimes it's difficult, though, to see God work in the midst of our waiting, isn't it? If you're like me, you might get impatient or a little anxious while you wait. I begin to fixate on all the things that I'm not doing, all the things that I could be doing if my waiting was over. Or I think about how this waiting is having a negative impact on my life. Like, God, it would, be just, it would be awesome if we could just get back to normal. God, it would be awesome if we could just get through this period. It would be, it would be great, Lord, if you just remove the barriers and, and, and allow us to go ahead with our plans. You see, I often view my period of waiting as something that I need to pass through as quickly as possible so that I can get to the other side because I have a hard time sitting still. If I'm not getting something done, it drives me nuts. In fact, I've been kind of organizing my garage during the Super Bowl this afternoon. I'll probably be sorting screws just so that I can feel like I was productive and accomplish something with my time. I got problems, I know. Sometimes we view that period as a moment that we just want to get through instead of realizing that in our waiting, God is working. You know, sometimes I struggle with my waiting because I assume that it means I have to stand still. But you know something? I was thinking about this and I was looking through the scriptures and I realized like nobody ever said we must sit idle while we wait. Nobody ever said that we must sit idle while we wait. See, Luke tells us that Simeon and Anna were devout and active in their faith. They didn't just say, all right, God, I'm just going to wait until you come. I'm not going to read the scriptures. I'm not going to study the prophecies. I'm not going to worship until you do this one thing for me. No, they were active in their faith. They weren't just sitting around waiting for the Messiah to come. They were watching. They were worshiping. And they continued their work while they were waiting. You know, I wonder if we miss peace in our waiting because we assume the wrong thing. We assume that waiting must equal inactivity, that we must sit around and do nothing. We often assume this helpless position in our waiting, don't we? As if we are the victims of our waiting, the victims of our circumstances. And so we only focus on the inconvenience that our waiting causes us. 
But in our waiting, God is working. And if God is working, then shouldn't we be working as well? Why is it that God is the only one that works in our waiting? We can be active in our waiting. In fact, there are three things that I want to share with you today that we can do to be active while we wait. First, in our waiting, we can worship. In our waiting, we worship. Anna gathered every day at the temple to worship the Lord. You see, worship wasn't just a a one hour a week activity for her. It was a lifestyle. You see, when we worship, it takes our minds off of ourselves and it directs our attention to God. Worship helps us continue to set our hearts and our minds on the things of God, reassuring us of God's goodness and helping us hang on to the promises that he has given us. Second, in our waiting, we watch. While it was revealed to Simeon that he would not pass before seeing the promised one, Simeon didn't just wait for the Messiah to come. He watched while he waited. Kind of reminds me of the story of the ten virgins who were waiting for the bridegroom to come, an analogy of reminding us to be vigilant, to be prepared, to be watching. So was Simeon in his life. He was devout in his faith. He was spiritually in tune with God because he was keeping watch and waiting for that Messiah to come. Third, in our waiting, we continue to work. One of my favorite moments of the story of the Exodus is this moment where where Moses had just led the Israelites up out of Egypt, and and they're they're being chased by the Egyptians, and they come to the Dead Sea, and, and there they are. It's like they come to a dead end, and And the people are afraid, and so Moses tells them this. He says, do not be afraid, stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You only need to stand still. Then you know what the Lord did? (laughs) The Lord says, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. I love that. It's like they're going to wait. Okay, God, do this great thing. All right. Well, you got a part to do in this too. I want you to raise your staff. I want you to spread your hands out. And when you do so, the waters will divide. And I want you to lead the Israelites across on dry ground. You see, it reminds me that we have an active part in the story, don't we? That in our waiting, we can continue our work and the things that God has called us to do. Sure, there are times where we must wait upon the Lord, where maybe God hasn't given us a direction yet, and we must sit, st- sit and simply be in God's presence. But that's not necessarily mean that our default position is always to stand still and wait for God to do something on our behalf. We can continue about the work that we know Christ has called us to, while we wait. We can continue to share a message of hope. We can continue to encourage one another. We can continue to share God's God's love and grace. And we can use our God-given gifts for his kingdom. Because in our waiting, we can join God's work. You know, we find missing peace in our waiting by recognizing that in our waiting, God is still working. We trust God in our waiting, even in those times in which it seems like God is silent, by offering God our worship and our praise. We trust God in our waiting, even when we cannot see the results, by staying vigilant, by staying active in our faith. And we trust that God is using us, even when we are not aware, because in our waiting, God is working. Let us pray. God, we confess that so many times um, we grow impatient. And there are times in our lives where, yes, we, we are to wait for you. And yet, Lord, we confess that sometimes we've allowed that, that period of waiting to lead us to a place of apathy and complacency. God, we confess that sometimes in our waiting we've allowed our fears and our anxieties to take over, to run wild. We've grown impatient, we've grown irritable, we've grown grumpy and even angry at times. And so God, we confess that we need your grace in our waiting. And Lord, I pray that if there's anybody here who feels like they've been in a a period of 400 years of silence, 
that you would just speak to their hearts right now as they cry out to you and say, Lord, I want to hear you. Lord, I want to experience in your life. Lord, I will wait for you. And God, I pray that if there's anybody here who is searching, maybe they're at a crossroads in their life and they're looking for direction. God, I pray that you would meet them right there in that intersection of where faith and life meet, just as you always have and you always will. That you would continue to guide us in your way. That you would continue to strengthen our faith in our waiting so that we may continue the work that you have called us to do. God, we give you thanks and praise that you are a God who is never asleep. You are a God who never leaves us nor abandons us. And so encourage us in our faith today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.